Among any list of paranormal topics, there is perhaps nothing as horrifying or as controversial as demonic possession. Since the beginning, humans have imagined what kind of evil beasts lurk within the darkest depths of our mysterious world. Among these feared creatures of the dark is the demon, a creature of hell who has the power to possess the body of a living, breathing victim. Through the systematic invasion of mind, body, and soul, this entity wreaks havoc in the human world, all while leaving the afflicted individual a prisoner in their own body. While modern psychologists and physicians contend that the so-called possession phenomenon is purely psychological, there are some cases that test even the most sensible of souls. Take, for example, the possession of Roland Doe. Between January and April of 1949, this seemingly normal 13-year-old began exhibiting exceptionally bizarre and truly grotesque behavior. More than just the antics of an unruly teenager, unexplainable events began to occur all around Roland. His bed would shake violently, heavy furniture and other objects flew around the room with ease. He seemed to possess knowledge of things he could not have possibly known. He began speaking in Latin, spitting profusely at priests and hurling disturbing obscenities at them. During violent and hysterical fits, Roland began physically attacking family members and church officials with what many described as otherworldly strength. But what was most disturbing was that Roland's body began to behave like a human Ouija board, with words and numbers appearing all over his body as if burned or scratched by an unseen force. The chilling story of Roland Doe was the inspiration behind the 1973 film The Exorcist, and it kickstarted America's modern obsession with the possession phenomenon. After the film, renowned paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren began traveling across the country investigating so-called hauntings and possession cases, and modern cinema continues to expand upon the legacy of The Exorcist. But how and why does a story from 75 years ago continue to captivate and perplex us? Perhaps it encourages us to ask ourselves, is the devil real? Can infernal spirits take control of our bodies? Was Roland's experience purely psychological, or is this the most intense and nightmarish coming-of-age story of all time? Hello everyone and happy Friday the 13th. Welcome back to Paranormal Community College. My name is Riley and today we are talking about the possession of Roland Doe. I hope everyone has a safe and fun Friday the 13th. Um, I got mine kickstarted a little bit early this week. I got my car stolen, so that's been a fun and interesting experience. Um, but thankfully, I have good insurance and awesome people in my life, so it's not too bad. Um, I'm sorry I haven't had any episodes recently. It's been a little bit of a rough, rough summer financially, so I haven't had as much time to focus on the podcast, but I'm really excited to be back. I'm going to release part one and part two of The Possession of Roland Doe, and then on Halloween, I'm going to release another two episodes, and then starting in November, I'm going to be back full throttle, and I hope to have video by then, so I'm really excited for that. Thanks for sticking with me. Sorry I had to take a break, but I am back and more excited than ever. So aside from all that, I decided on the possession of Roland Doe for today's episode because I thought it was fitting for Friday the 13th because at the forefront here, we have the Ouija board, we have demons, we have creepy religious dogma, and the revamped Exorcist movie just came out last week. So I thought it'd be interesting to revisit this infamously controversial case. So without further ado, let's dive into the possession of Roland Doe. And one thing to note here is that Roland Doe is, of course, a pseudonym. The boy in question was only a teenager at the time, so his identity was kept secret. Many sources say the boy was Ronald Edwin Hunkeller, but others say it has always and will always remain truly anonymous, so for the remainder of the episode, I will just be referring to him only as Roland Doe. Our story begins in January of 1949 in Mount Rainier, Maryland, a suburb of Washington, D.C. The Doe family lived in a middle-class home and consisted of 13-year-old Roland, his father, his mother, and his grandmother. Other evidence suggests the family actually lived in Cottage City, Maryland, but whatever the case may be, it's not essential to the story anyway. By all accounts, Roland was a regular teenage boy. He liked comic books, 
wasn't the most studious, but still a bright and mostly well-behaved child. He liked board games, and in particular, Roland liked to play with the Ouija board. His Aunt Harriet from St. Louis, Missouri, introduced Roland to the Ouija board, and the two of them were very close. A spiritualist, Aunt Harriet would regale Roland and his mother with stories of seances, where mediums became possessed by the dead in order to deliver messages from the spirit world. The Doe family, who were of German descent, were Lutheran, and presumably Harriet was too, but spiritualism and dabbling with spirit boards wasn't necessarily a no-no for them. Spiritualists came from all different religious backgrounds, and being a spiritualist did not mean you could not also be a Christian in their eyes. And most spiritualists tended to be Christian. They argued that there are numerous instances where spirit communication is practiced in the Bible, and therefore, there is nothing wrong with a little ghost action every now and then. But unfortunately, Aunt Harriet became ill during the chilly winter back in St. Louis, succumbing to her illness on January 26, 1949. Many argue that Harriet's death was the catalyst for all the unexplained phenomenon that began to occur in the Doe household, and they may well be right. It's also important to note that after Harriet's death, Roland began playing with the Ouija board by himself to try and contact her. A big no-no for Ouija board users in general. However, the paranormal activity that became a daily part of the Doe household actually began 11 days earlier on the night of January 15th. On this particular evening, Roland and his grandma were alone in the house when they kept hearing a mysterious dripping noise in the home. They searched high and low for a source of the dripping noise with no luck. But as they were walking around the house, the pair also noticed a painting of Jesus Christ shaking against the wall as if something were bumping the wall behind it. When Roland's father came home, he too searched the house for a source of the dripping noise to no avail. And if this was all that happened, it would be easy to dismiss both things as a problem with the pipes. But over the next few weeks, things escalated quickly. The dripping noises were followed by water leaking from the walls and ceilings with seemingly no explanation. The family also began hearing scratching noises beneath the grandmother's bed. The scratching noises quickly moved from the grandmother's room to Roland's room and Mr. Doe, assuming they had rats, called an exterminator, but they didn't find any rats. They did place rat poison beneath the floorboards, but the nightly scratching persisted. When I was researching for this story, I was reminded how many scary stories I've read or scary movies I've watched where scratching noises are depicted as a first sign of a demonic infestation, and it made me wonder if A, this all began with the story of Roland Doe, or B, this really is one of the first symptoms of a potentially malicious haunting. Along with the scratching noises, Roland began hearing squeaking noises in his bedroom at night. It was described by Roland as squeaky or wet shoes walking around his bed. At first, his family didn't believe Roland when he talked about the squeaking noises or said that he felt his bed shaking at night or that he felt an evil presence in his room. That was until one particularly terrifying night. Roland's mother and his grandmother decide to sleep in the bedroom with Roland to see if they could maybe comfort him, console him, or see if what Roland was saying was true. They both heard the familiar scratching noises as well as the odd squeaking that seemed to walk the length of Roland's bed as if to the beat of a drum. Roland's mother yelled to forces unseen, if you are here, Aunt Harriet, knock three times. And three knocks there were. She asked Harriet if she could produce four knocks. And indeed, four knocks there were. During this night, Roland began feeling a heavy pressure on his chest as if something was sitting on it much like a sleep paralysis episode. And then his bed began shaking violently, his mom and grandmother as witnesses. When the bed stopped shaking, the bed sheets, quote, stood up above the surface of the bed in a curled form as though held up with starch. Real quick, I think it's interesting that according to this account, Roland's mother immediately asks this unseen spirit who she has assumed is Aunt Harriet to knock three times if it's really her. That is such a classic, like, spiritualist thing. And in the book I read, which is called Possessed, and the author's last name is Alan, Thomas Allen is his name, um, it's mentioned that the mother is really into spiritualism, but I think she might have been much more into the whole spiritualism thing than the author was aware of, and of course, I'm just assuming. But as we go on throughout the story, Roland's mother seems to kind of egg on this whole spiritualism aspect, the whole Ouija board thing, and trying to get in contact with Aunt Harriet. But moving on, 
the disturbances didn't just occur at the boy's home. The phenomenon or spirit, the ghost of his aunt or something more sinister, followed Roland to school. His teachers and schoolmates recalled his desk would slide across the room as, and they couldn't tell how, or even if, Roland was causing it. When his teachers scolded him to stop, Roland would promise that it wasn't him, that it wasn't his fault. It's interesting to note that Thomas Allen, the author of Possessed, said that it was as if his desk, quote, glided around the school floor like a planchette. A planchette being the instrument that glides around the Ouija board to spell out words and letters supposedly from beyond the grave. And this whole Ouija board theme throughout the story is really interesting and kind of unique. You have a boy who is knowledgeable about the Ouija board, knowledgeable about spiritualism, has played with the Ouija board numerous times, even by himself, and then is described as a human Ouija board. Also keep in mind, he did know about mediums and seances, and he would listen to stories that his Aunt Harriet would tell him about these mediums becoming possessed by spirits. So whether you ultimately believe this is psychological or paranormal, I think that little tidbit is really relevant. But eventually, poor Roland became too embarrassed to go to school, or perhaps his parents were tired of hearing about his strange behavior from his teachers, so he was taken out of school until they could figure out what was going on. And then as he stayed at home, playing board games by day and being tormented by the invisible who knows what by night, the activity became worse and worse. Objects from coat hangers to fruit to full-on heavy furniture began to fly across the room or levitate on their own. In one occurrence, a heavy chair lifted into the air with Roland in it and flung him across the floor. This was witnessed not only by the members of the Doe household, but also extended family from St. Louis as well. In another occurrence, the extended family watched in horror as another chair twirled about like a spinning top. A kitchen table flipped over on its own. A vase flew into the wall and shattered. So things were flying around, his bed was shaking every night, the family was thinking it may or may not be the ghost of Aunt Harriet, but whatever it might have been, the family wanted answers. They took Roland to physicians and psychologists, but no one could find anything wrong with Ronald. I'm sorry, Roland. (laughs) I'll probably make that mistake a couple times in this episode. But a couple suggested that he was just doing this for attention. Others suggested that Roland was completely normal, nothing at all wrong with stories of levitating furniture and bed shaking. The most they would say is that he seemed high strung or perhaps just going through a rebellious phase. In fact, it would be the priests and other church officials, both Lutheran and Catholic, who were really the first to suggest that maybe they should make sure this wasn't a psychological or neurological problem first. The few reverends and priests involved in this story looked first and foremost for a psychological explanation, mental illness, depression or anxiety at home, perhaps a psychotic break, but they could find none and were forced to explore other options. The first man of God the Doe sought help from was Reverend Luther Miles Schultz. Now, Reverend Schultz was, like the Doe family, Lutheran. And Lutherans, certainly not a Lutheran preacher, Lutherans didn't necessarily believe in demonic possession or the right of exorcism. According to Martin Luther, the founder of Lutheranism, the idea of demonic possession and exorcisms in general was devilish in itself, an old and dangerous superstition of the Catholic Church. To believe that a demon, a being from the depths of hell, would even be allowed to enter the body of a human being was preposterous. To suggest that a demon could enter the body of a Christian, a saved individual, was demonic in itself. So with this kind of background, Reverend Schultz assumed that Roland was either sleepwalking or lying. He thought Roland was likely causing it, how and why he wasn't sure, but he agreed to help the family to get to the bottom of it. And while skeptical, later events forced Schultz to question his own beliefs. On the night of February 16, 1949, the Doe family was awoken by Roland's violent screams. This, unfortunately, had become a nightly occurrence. But these screams were different, guttural, petrified, piercing. They seemed to shake the walls of their two-story house. Mom and Dad entered Roland's room to find his bed shaking violently, and then a heavy wooden dresser slid across the room in front of the door, blocking their exit. The drawers of the dresser began frantically opening and closing by themselves, and then, as if by some phantom flick of the wrist or snap of one's fingers, the bed ceased shaking, the dresser drawers lay still and closed, 
and the family sat by Roland's bed as he slept soundly. Until in his sleep, Roland exhibited a new symptom, or one they at least hadn't been around to hear yet. With eyes closed, fast asleep, Roland began cursing and saying obscene things in his sleep. Apparently, whatever Roland said was so vile, so grotesque, Mr. and Mrs. Doe didn't feel comfortable repeating it to anybody, certainly not to Reverend Schultz. However, upon hearing about this and upon seeing how shaken up Mr. and Mrs. Doe were at having witnessed something extraordinarily bizarre, Mr. Schultz suggested that the boys spend the night at his house with him and his wife. And I know what you must already be thinking. Reverend invites a teen boy over for a sleepover, big red flag. But let's not jump to any conclusions here. If anything, I think Reverend Schultz was the one in for something extra effed up that night. So on February 17th, Roland went over to the Schultz house where he and the Reverend slept in one room in two separate twin beds while his wife slept in the room next door. Schultz was convinced that this would help the Doe family finally get some rest and Schultz could really see how Roland was doing it, catch him in the act, so to speak. But around midnight, Reverend Schultz woke up to a strange sound. It was the sound of Roland's bed shaking. Only this time, it was more like the bed was vibrating. He said it was like the vibrating beds you see at motels, only faster. However, Roland was perfectly still. Schultz eventually was able to wake Roland up and suggested that they go have some hot cocoa downstairs and then try to sleep in the living room. According to Schultz, Roland seemed totally unaware that anything odd had occurred. In the living room, the two were sipping on some hot cocoa in two separate chairs when all of a sudden, Roland's chair slid to the back wall with him in it. The chair then began to tip over on its side. Reverend Schultz ran over and attempted to get the chair planted firmly back on the ground, but it took him, he says, at least a minute to wrestle with some unseen force of amazing strength in order to get control of the chair, at which time Roland fell to the floor and appeared to be in a trance-like state. After things settled down, Schultz suggested that Roland sleep on the floor since apparently chairs and beds don't take kindly to poor Roland. And apparently neither did the floor because shortly after falling asleep, Roland began to slide around the floor in his blankets. He was sliding so quickly across the floor and under furniture that it seemed almost impossible, according to Reverend Schultz. Schultz finally yelled at Roland, stop doing this, to which Roland replied, I'm not doing it. Now I've seen a lot of horror movies, so in my head I'm picturing like supernaturally fast sliding around the floor as if being dragged by some invisible hand. However, I wasn't there, so who knows if it was something Roland could have done by himself. But one way or another, that was the beginning of the end for Reverend Schultz's involvement in the case. He stuck around for about a week after, checking in on Roland here and there. On February 26th, Schultz watched as some invisible claw scratched the 95-pound boy along his arms, chest, and legs, and he basically threw in the towel after that, saying that he needed to go to the Catholics because they know what to do about this kind of thing. He would later claim that he suffered from intense nightmares for some time after dealing with Roland's case. But paranormal or not, can't blame him for having nightmares because this sounds like the babysitting gig from hell. But before we continue with this strange saga, I want to quickly address the four stages of demonic possession as laid out by Father Gabriel Amorth, Chief Exorcist of Rome from 1986 to 2000. Because what is interesting about these so-called demonic hauntings is that they follow a certain pattern or a certain formula. First, there is the infestation. This is typically what we would call the haunted house stage of events. Things go missing or appear to move on their own. Perhaps the people of the house start to notice a foul odor. They may hear footsteps, voices, banging on the walls, maybe a shadow out of the corner of their eye. You know, typical things go bump in the night kind of stuff. Then, according to Father Morth, There's what's called demonic oppression and consists of physical attacks which may appear mild or even explainable at first, such as sleep paralysis, the feeling that someone or something is sitting on one's chest. It can also manifest in the form of extreme illness, depression, anxiety, or even insomnia. In the horror movie formula, this is also the stage in which someone in the house, usually the dad, starts exhibiting some anger problems. Perhaps mom and dad start arguing all the time, maybe even becoming physical with each other. This, according to Father Amorth, can be tied to demonic oppression. The next stage is called obsession, and this is when we reach a point of potentially no return. The victim, as we'll see with Roland here in a bit, or where we're seeing things transition to already, becomes consumed by the phenomenon happening around them and within them. 
They have extreme difficulty functioning in daily life because the activity becomes almost constant. They reach a point where they are not really sleeping at all. Many may become suicidal while others may take the homicidal route. And once they reach this point, any old minister in town ain't gonna do. This is when you call in a true expert, an exorcist. The fourth and final stage, of course, is possession. And to most accurately describe the ultimate stage of possession, I'd like to read to you an excerpt from Thomas Allen's Possession. Contrary to popular belief, possession is not demons entering a person's body and taking over his or her soul. A person's free will is never removed, only severely compromised. In possession, a person is so physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually broken down by going through the other three stages that demonic spirits are able to seize occasional control over that person's actions. So I think what he's suggesting here is that your soul is always your own in this scenario. No demon is capable of coming in and literally dragging your soul to hell, although that's what it is depicted in many a horror movie nowadays. But it can, of course, severely debilitate you. Symptoms of this stage include superhuman strength, speaking in a language the victim should not be able to know, usually Latin, extreme aversion to holy objects, intolerance for holy water, knowledge of secret or hidden information, and perhaps most disturbing, a change in the victim's voice as well as their facial features. Now these are the stages of demonic possession as laid out by Father Amorth, a Catholic priest. Psychologists would have something very different to say, usually suggesting that this is related to a neurological disorder such as epilepsy, or they blame some kind of undiagnosed mental illness or a psychotic break in conjunction with religious zeal or religious fanaticism. But there has been no physician or psychologist who can definitively define or categorize this possession phenomenon. I have my own thoughts on the matter, but I'll save that for part two. Okay, so Reffin Schultz was like, okay, this is above my pay grade, maybe this dude actually is possessed, so he helps get the family in touch with a local priest by the name of Father E. Albert Hughes. After meeting the family and discussing matters with Reverend Schultz and the Archbishop, Father Hughes is granted permission to perform an exorcism on the boy. And I kind of think things weren't 100% legit because it sounded like it was an easy peasy process to get approved for the exorcism, and I know that is definitely not the case nowadays at least. Also, Father Hughes wasn't really willing to follow the proper procedures. First and foremost, Father Hughes didn't have any experience as an exorcist, nor did pretty much anyone to follow in this case. For example, the priest is supposed to fast on a diet of minimal bread and water while they're performing the exorcism, which usually takes weeks and days. It doesn't take like one night like it does in the movies. But Father Hughes was like, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. I don't think I can do all this on bread and water, and I can't say that I blame him. So beginning in the latter half of February 1949, Father Hughes conducted a series of visits and interviews with the Doe family. He witnessed enough unexplainable phenomena that he decided to go forward with the exorcism. While skeptical at first, he believed something evil may be controlling the boy when one day on a visit, Roland spoke to him in Latin, saying, O oh, priest of Christ, you know that I am the devil. Why do you keep bothering me? So Father Hughes gets Roland admitted to Alexian Brothers Hospital where they agree to allow Father Hughes to perform an exorcism on Roland. He chooses a hospital because he wants there to be nurses and other medical staff around him. He knows he's inexperienced. He knows that Roland needs to be taken care of medically and psychologically, not just spiritually. So choosing a hospital is actually a good choice for Father Hughes. So Father Hughes strapped Roland down on his mattress in his room at Alexian Brothers Hospital, and he began the appropriate recitations. And if you see in the show Supernatural, their exorcism spiel is surprisingly accurate, so it started off kind of like that. Roland appeared uncomfortable, as demonically possessed people usually do during an exorcism, writhing about in his bed, cursing at the priest, all that good stuff, but things rapidly escalated to a level of violence previously undocumented. During the exorcism, Roland managed to break off a mattress spring, break through his restraints, and slash Father Hughes across the shoulder. Now the gash was so severe and so deep that Father Hughes received over a hundred stitches. And again, this was all inflicted by a boy who was only 95 pounds. After a few days of rest, Father Hughes returned one last time. 
During the exorcism, words started appearing on the boy's skin as if he was a human Ouija board. Across the boy's chest appeared the name Lewis in bloody red scratches. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Doe took this to mean that they should go to St. Louis. Mrs. Doe asked the unseen entity in the room with them, whom I think she believed very much was Harriet, when should we go to St. Louis? To which the word Saturday appeared on his lower abdomen. And I know this seems crazy, but Mrs. Doe then allegedly asked Aunt Harriet slash Roland slash Mr. Demon Guy how long they should stay in St. Louis, to which three and a half weeks appeared on his chest. Sounds too insane to be true, and as far as I know, there's never been any possession case or haunting case where words routinely appear on the victim's body like this, especially in response to specific questions. I don't know what to believe, but we'll talk about theories in part two. Realizing he was out of his element and not quite equipped to deal with forces from beyond his comprehension, Father Hughes offered to ride with the Doe's to St. Louis, where he would help them get in touch with a more qualified team of priests and physicians. And so they left by train for St. Louis on March 5th, 1949, in hopes that it would appease whoever or whatever was torturing their son. Perhaps Aunt Harriet had unfinished business back in St. Louis and was using Roland's body as a means to get there. Perhaps some kind of bored demon from hell summoned by the Ouija board was dragging the family to and fro for shits and giggles. Or maybe young Roland was deeply, deeply mentally disturbed. And that's gonna conclude part one of the possession of Roland Doe. Thank you guys so much for listening. Be sure to hit that subscribe or follow button, pretty, pretty please. And I will see you guys in part two, where we will discuss all the crazy events that happened in St. Louis and Roland's final exorcism. So until then, take care, everyone.